uh, as one of the, uh, the questioners in the last session pointed out, particularly relevant to the two cities in, in which we live. Uh, I'd like to just uh, lead off straight away with our first panelist. Uh, we have a very good mixture of people from the financial services industry and the regulatory side here uh, to really talk about the actions that we need to take for preventing future crises a subject that uh, the last session and Lord Turner in particular uh, did a good job of, of laying out for us. Uh, I think uh, we will be trying to, to stick to 15 minutes each for these speeches so that we have a little bit of time uh, for Q&A at the end. Uh, and I'd like to, uh, to ask to, to start off for us uh, Andrew Crockett, uh, here on my left, the president of J.P. Morgan Chase International, uh, perhaps even better known for the 10 years that he spent uh, running the Bank for International Settlements in Basel. Uh, he also was the first chairman of the Fa Financial Stability Forum, uh, which is gaining a, a, a new title and a new role, I understand, uh, based on the results of the last G20 meetings in London. So, Andrew, would you like to lead us off, please? Well, thanks very much, Dan. I The first thing I would say is uh, to echo something, that, a remark that was made in the last session. We are not going to prevent future crises, and that should not be the standard to which uh, the new um, arrangements are held. But it is a legitimate and indeed imperative objective to try to uh, limit the extent of crises and to uh, reduce the frequency of them. And I think there are mechanisms, as I will say, at the international level that can be used uh, to achieve that. Uh, the international level is complicated because, as has already been remarked, uh, finance is a global industry, uh, the players are global, the markets are global, and yet regulation is national and it will remain national um, for uh, rather obvious political reasons for the foreseeable future. Uh, so the global coordination of regulation has to take place by mechanisms that enhance harmonization and coordination amongst independent regulators rather than a search for a holy grail uh, of a global systemic regulator which I don't think is in the cards and likely to be in the cards for some time. If you think about the financial, the international financial architecture, that's the phrase that's often used in communiques of the G20 and other bodies, and it's what we're talking about here today. It's got three components, I think. One is the overall model by which you expect the financial uh, system to run, what are the objectives. Uh, the set of regulations that translate those overall objectives into uh, practical management of the system and the institutions that are charged with regulating parts or all of the system. Now we heard this morning that the model, the Washington consensus, is broken and, import, and in important respects it is broken and we have to move on from that recognizing, as Adair Turner said, uh, that certain markets don't function adequately and stably enough without regulation. Uh, but I always think of the way in which we brought up our children, and you will, many of you relate to this, uh, when there was a silence upstairs. Uh, my wife would often shout and say, I don't know what you're doing, but whatever it is, stop it. <laughs> um, and that was a pretty good admonition for children, and it may be quite a good admonition for financial institutions too, but not all the time. <laughs> and so regulation uh, could be used to stop very many kinds of financial intermediation that have caused problems in the past. But that almost certainly would not in all cases be the most efficient way of doing it, and in some cases it would have unintended consequences in that the activities you wanted to stop by regulated institutions would go elsewhere. So I want to talk a little bit about systemic stability, because uh, what is at issue is how to design a system not that preserves individual institutions but one that preserves the stability of the overall system when the shocks that inevitably hit it uh, will occur will occur and uh, uh, an impact on individual institutions and markets um, 
I said that it's a global industry and regulation is national. It's also true that crises hit individual institutions, but instability is systemic. So that disjuncture has to be addressed too. And many countries are now talking about establishing a market stability regulator or systemic stability regulator. Uh, and what I'm going to say uh, this morning uh, reflects that at the international level, uh, the, international, the need for and functions of a systemic global regulator or a combination of regulators operating at the international level. And you can describe the functions of a systemic regulator in many ways, but I'll group them under five headings. Uh, one is oversight, uh, looking at the financial system as a whole rather than sector by sector in order to see the potential vulnerabilities that build up as you find new institutions, new products, new business models. If you think of an example from the present crisis, uh, we had uh, the development over a number of years of the so-called originate to distribute model, which is not a bad model for dispersing risks, uh, but it required um, both, uh, it involved changes in originating practices, underwriting practices, it involved the use of credit rating agencies, it involved distribution to unregulated players, and collectively it resulted in a situation which, as we know, has blown up in our faces. It will be desirable, it seems to me, that a systemic regulator should have an oversight function to track changes that occur, sometimes gradually, sometimes rapidly, in the financial system and to identify the vulnerabilities that they cause and the means in which those vulnerabilities could be addressed. A second aspect of systemic regulation is rulemaking. Uh, we know that regulation involves setting rules. In the case of uh, banks, uh, those are primarily rules for capital holding uh, and capital quality. Um, and we need to make sure that those regulations, which in the past have been designed uh, from, from a micro-prudential standpoint to assure the stability of individual institutions are consistent with a macro-prudential stability when the actions of individual institutions interact with one another. We don't want to create a situation in which prudent protective responses by one institution in fact magnify the problems at a systemic level. A third function of a systemic stability regulator is supervision. Supervision of uh, institutions that are either too big to fail, systemically significant, that have broad reach. As we know from what was said earlier this morning, we don't know which ones they are. But if you've got internationally um, active, <coughs> systemically significant, too big to fail institutions, that clearly involves a number of different regulators and it clearly involves global stability. A fourth function is enforcement. I won't say too much more about that, but rulemaking, it seems to me, implies uh, a responsibility somewhere for enforcement. And a fi fifth function, in my list anyway, is crisis resolution and management. Crises will be, when they emerge, international, because uh, unless we abandon the international nature of the financial system and capital markets, they'll arise at the international level. So those are functions that I think have to be identified both at the national level and at the international level. As I said earlier, we won't have, in my view, a global financial authority uh, charged with treaty-based responsibilities in these areas. So we have to rely on the mechanisms of international communication. Who are the key players? Well, national regulators are obviously important in this. Central banks are important, their historic uh, responsibility for financial stability. Standard setters, less well known, uh, but of key importance. The Basel Committee on Banking Supervision, uh, equivalent uh, rule setting bodies for securities and insurance products, and the uh, accounting standard setters, uh, the audit practice standard setters. There are 
several bodies that have responsibility for setting standards that are important uh, for helping preserve stability. Then you have the international financial institutions, the key ones being the IMF and the BIS, and you have ad hoc groupings such as the um, G20, uh, which was referred to this morning, and the Financial Stability Board. Now, uh, I don't have time to do a full mapping of those responsibilities into institutions, uh, but let me just say a few words uh, in order not to take too much time about what role the Financial Stability Board could play in this, and particularly could play in oversight and rulemaking. The Financial Stability Board brings together regulators, finance ministries, and central banks from uh, the G20 countries, together with the standard setters, uh, that's to say the, uh, uh, the Basel Committee on Banking Supervision, the insurance regulators, the uh, uh, accounting standard setters, and it brings the international organizations. So it is a body that in a sense has the broadest representation within a single entity of those that ought to be expert in spotting financial trends that would threaten the stability of the financial system and ought to be able to propose um, uh, responses to emerging threats. I think, uh, and this is an idea I haven't seen expressed uh, otherwise, but the Financial Stability Board could probably <coughs> perform a useful function in reviewing the standards that are proposed by individual standard setters. Let me just mention a couple as an example. The capital requirements set under Basel II appear now to have been a contributory factor to the pro-cyclicality in the financial system. They made a lot of sense uh, as requirements imposed on individual banks to preserve prudential stability of those banks, they made less sense as a means of preserving the stability of the system at the macro level. Another example is accounting standards. Uh, the move to mark-to-market accounting has got many, many positive features, which I won't go into, but it does have the drawback, as we have seen, of fostering pro-cyclicality in the responses of financial institutions. And I believe it could be useful for something like the Financial Stability Board to have a review function to assess the standards that are adopted for microprudential reasons uh, for their validity at the macroprudential level. The IMF is, of course, uh, a very important institution with macroeconomic functions. And I think the IMF comes into play both in the oversight, in the uh, identification of macroeconomic threats that arise as a result of macroeconomic policies. A good example would be the uh, balance of payments imbalances that sprang up over the past several years and probably contributed to the background uh, causes of the uh, current crisis. And the IMF has an important role in resolution because it's the only institution with the financial resources that can lend to countries that are hit by crises. So uh, in brief, my view of how we should approach this is to identify, first of all, and be clear about the model uh, that we want to run the international financial system by. I think it will be an open uh, market-based model uh, with a recognition that the markets don't always function without regulation. We need a set of regulations and rules uh, drawn up by the standard setters but approved by a wider body such as the FSB to put that model into practice. And we need um, institutions, uh, and I think the IMF and the Financial Stability Board will be absolutely key in that, to manage these rules, to oversee and enforce them, and eventually to provide crisis resolution when, as I'm afraid inevitably happens, the next crisis comes upon us. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much, Andrew, for that thoughtful analysis of uh, really who could and should do what as we move into this uh, new era of financial regulation. Uh, I'd like next to call on Scott Marcello.
Uh, Scott is a member of KPMG's global leadership team for financial services uh, and is also an SEC reviewing partner. Uh, in his past life, he spent time with FASB as well, so understands that side and I think uh, is an expert really both in the theory and the practice of the accounting side. So, Scott, welcome. Well, thank you. Good morning. Uh, whether I'm an expert or not, you can be the judge of. Uh, I'm going to spend a few minutes talking about something which is a little bit off the beaten path. We thought it would be nice to just spend a few minutes talking about the role of auditors when you think about what's going on in the world today and as we move forward. And in fact, if you look at the program, we frame the question, is any reform desirable? Now, one logical question you might ask is how in the world could anyone speak for 15 minutes on a question that could simply be answered yes or no? And I'll show you right now. <laughs> in, in fact, I really think this is a very relevant question. And, and I realize from an audit perspective, you know, we always like to speak about things what, that we're comfortable with and know. But in fact, if you think about the role of the auditor in the world today and what they should and can do, I think there's a big gap in that. I think there's a very large gap between what auditors do today and what they should and may be capable of doing to help stabilize the system and help us move forward. I think also, to think about it, we have to ground it. And so I'd like to spend a few minutes just talking about some things that I think are very foundational to the concept that I'm about to, to share with you. First of all, no, no surprise to any of you, the world we live in is incredibly complex. And so if you think about it, the accounting standards we apply are even more complex. In fact, one could argue, well, why is that? And I would say, well, you know, one argument simply is that the world's very complex, big companies, lots going on, therefore the accounting standards in and of themselves also have to be complex. I think that's a little too simple, and I think we miss some key points there. First of all, I think we lose sight of the fact that too often we, particularly as auditors and accountants, like to succumb ourselves to the idea that whatever treatment is pure or technically superior is the right answer. And I think, in, fa I think in fact, we often do that at the sacrifice of something that's much more relevant and understandable. I think also accounting by definition is complex for a lot of reasons. First of all, we have mixed attributes. Think about, for those of you that are at all aware of accounting and you live with it day to day, think about the accounting standards we've issued over the last 10 years. If you think about the accounting for derivatives and hedging on a global basis, you think about securitization accounting, consolidation accounting, and fair value accounting. You know, just to name a few that can instill emotion. Whoever would have thought accountants could get people worked up? And the reality is that's, that's, that is part of the fabric that we're all working within today. Another thing is there's an absolute view very frequently shared by users and preparers of financials that the accounting rules don't align with the economic substance of what's going on. One of relevance. How relevant is this information to the decisions I'm trying to make and the things I'm trying to consider? When I think about that, I also think there's another fundamental problem, and that fundamental problem is we don't even agree on what the purpose and objective of accounting is. We, we like to say we do. We have accounting concepts and standards that we think people share, but the reality is if you really fundamentally analyze it, there's a lot more disagreement than we'd like to acknowledge. I, I think a perfect example of that, in fact, is fair value accounting. Not, not how to do it, although we could argue that, and let's face it, there's a motion, right? Everybody has a view on this. Preparers have a view, regulators have a view, users have a view, taxi drivers in New York have a view. They can tell you why and how fair value accounting contributed to the demise of the capital systems in the world. Everybody has a perspective when you think about it. But, but the reality is, when you ask those people, you can find people who love fair value accounting, or, or at least support it. They'll not love it, but at least support it. <laughs> and I don't hear that one. Uh, you can certainly find people that hate it. Uh, you can also find a group of people that say, you know what, it's actually a valid principle. My real worry is, is when should it be applied? I don't, I don't buy into it's the proper measurement attribute a lot of times in my financials. And so we don't agree fab under, under the very fabric of what we're talking about as to what the objective should be of the financial information in question. Another question I'd like to pose to you is who reads this stuff anyway? If you think about it, 10 years, 20 years, 30 years ago, easily, Financial statements on average were 40, 50, 60 pages long, and that was a complex global organization. Today, they're literally hundreds of pages. On average, several hundred pages for the largest companies. And let's face it, you could say, well, that's the world's more complex, the company's more complex, therefore we need all that additional information. That may be true, but I hypothesize that the users of the financial statements don't have the attention span that's grown proportionately with that amount of information. 
And I can't prove it to you, and I'm certainly not a predictor of the future, but if I use my teenage children as any indication, the attention span of the next generation certainly is not going to get any bigger. So how do we solve this problem? And let's also face it, putting things in context is very important, right? We have all this data, all this information. We want the users to understand it and be presented. We want to put it in context. But doesn't that inevitably end up in narrative and spin and in perspectives that are very difficult to sort through what's fact, what's fiction, what's your perspective, what's another perspective? So quite frankly, this is a very challenging environment that we're in. And the last question I'd like to pose in this complexity area is, does it always have to be additive? If you think about it, every solution we've come up with for financial accounting and reporting, it, maybe not all, but I would say nearly all, has led to more information, more disclosure, more analysis, more sensitivity analysis. Is that actually, is that, can, can we perpetuate that? Can we make that a useful, relevant piece of information if that's our tact? So then you say, okay, it's complex out there, and then you have the auditor, and I would say if the financial reporting regime is often misunderstood. I would say the auditor's role might be equally misunderstood, or at least not fully understood. So don't, under, don't misunderstand me. I'm not complaining. I'm not looking for someone to appreciate me more. In fact, I'm quite used to not being appreciated. But, but the point being is, as an auditor, what is it that we do? I mean, a lot of people recognize we issue opinions, and those opinions cover financial statements. They also often cover the internal controls of financial statements. But maybe a more relevant question is, what don't we do? In fact, there are vast amounts of information in the financial statements that people receive on a regular basis that have no coverage by an auditor whatsoever. A lot of the financial data that's out in the, in the marketplace, whether it be in the US or globally, a lot of that information, I think people would be surprised, users of the financials would be surprised, they're not actually subject to the audit. And maybe, maybe it should, maybe it shouldn't be, but certainly I think there's an expectation gap in that context. So when I think about all this, the complexity of the accounting, the difficulty and vastness of financial reporting, the role of the auditor, at best I see a very complex situation where I think that shareholders, regulators, and stakeholders often are confused at best. So what's the answer? And, and to go back to the fundamental question, is any reform desirable? Well, in my personal view, it's a resounding yes. There is reform that needs to be done, so what can it be and what can the role of auditors and others be in forging ahead in that respect? First of all, I do believe that accountants have to step up and be part of the leadership of this debate. You know, when it comes to accounting rules and financial statement reporting, we, we've got to promote keeping our eye on the ball. We have to focus on the real goals, the goals that ultimately matter. In my view, having been at the, the, the Financial Accounting Standard Board and others, I think we have to resist as a profession the, the idea of either observing or contributing to kind of the esoteric debates in lieu of the major issues that have to be resolved. You know, for example, we have spent months and years debating whether or not investments are other than temporarily impaired here in the United States. Instead of fighting about what other than temporarily impaired means, instead, why don't we focus on really stepping up and thinking about how do we do a better job of preventing or presenting credit risk, market risk, and other risks that are incredibly important to the users of the financial statements and the companies that present those financial statements. So what can we do? I think another thing that we can do is we can, we can think about, and this may be a pejorative question, do users of financial statements prefer conceptually pure information or relevant and understandable information? That seems like a simple question, and it's not always mutually exclusive, but I think it requires some hard decisions of priorities and what we're going to focus on as both users, regulators, and preparers, and, and also auditors of that information. If you think about it, I can be a little self-serving. I think the audit profession has done a fairly good job in today's world following and dealing with the rules that exist and doing our job. Now, yes, there have been audit failures, and I am sure as we go through this audit, this cycle of, of, of the uh, credit cycle, there will be, uh, be other audit failures. I think there's also going to be major business failures, which do not have anything to do with necessarily what, with what was presented in the financial statements of those companies. But at the end of the day, is that satisfactory? As, for me as a professional, is it OK to say, let's say I did 100%. Let's say I, I never had an audit failure. Is that good enough? And I think the answer is no. As a profession, we've got to step back and say, well, how can we contribute to this debate? How can we add to the regime that's going to be in place the future of what good regulation should look like in the financial services industry? 
So what I believe we can and should do, and what I know I want to do, is I want to contribute to the debate and the improvements. I'd also offer that apart from the regulators themselves, we often have one of the broadest perspectives as accountants and auditors to what's going on in the financial services industry. We're able to bring a varied and global perspective to the table, and we also can bring independence and a, per a perspective that is not vested in any particular interest. Collectively, I think we can add to and help to change the rules for the better. I also think we've got to remain focused. As I said, we've got to stay focused on what's relevant, what's understandable. I don't think we should embark on a campaign to try to convince everybody of what auditors actually do. I think we have to acknowledge there's an expectation gap between users of financial statements and regulators and others, and we have to step up to the plate to help narrow that gap and meet those expectations. And I think at the end of the day, we also have to be honest and candid that all this comes at a cost. And I'm not campaigning for increased audit fees. <laughs> what I am thinking about, though, is it requires a lot of effort and engagement on all parties to make this happen. We have to be willing to make hard decisions about what information truly is useful and relevant, what information is redundant and less important. We have to make sure that we're taking away from the, the, the equation things that are actually distracting people and not adding to the, in, adding to the process. I also believe we've got to minimize second guessing. I think we've got to protect the stakeholders and at the same time help people move forward with very valid and, and relevant judgments so that we can push things forward rather than continuously looking backward. At the end of the day, I think that there's a lot to be done in this area. And to come back to the question, I, I certainly would say that with regard to the role of the auditor, there's a lot of reform that can and should be made. I, as an auditor myself, would like to be part of that debate and part of the, the solution. And I think that we can add a lot of value to the equation. Thank you. Thank you very much, Scott. And uh, I think that was a, probably an unusual example of self-criticism on the part of the audit <laughs> profession. But so some very interesting ideas there. Uh, let's move on to Bill Isaac, um, who's currently chairman of the Secura Group and managing director of LECG, as explained in, in your brochure. But he also served uh, in, at an important time as FI, FDIC chairman and uh, brings both the private and the public sector experience to some of these interesting questions and serves on a number of boards. So I also, I guess, uh, understands the practicalities of uh, how all this affects companies. So, Bill. Thank welcome. you. It's very nice to be here. I uh, had jotted some notes down on what I was going to talk about, and I've changed it all after listening <laughs> to the, the first two uh, speakers, which is what happens when you go third. Uh, and and glad, thankfully, I'm not number four in line. Uh, but in any event, I, I think it's very important to focus on the lessons that we need to learn this time around. Because if we learn the wrong lessons, uh, we'll come up with the wrong solutions. And I'm afraid, from all, from most of the public dialogue you're hearing right now, I'm afraid we are going to run. We are going to learn the 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 long the wrong lessons. Uh, that that seems to be happening. Let me give you an example of something that I hear a lot, uh, and that is that this is the worst economic crisis in since the Great Depression. Uh, that's just not true. I actually served as chairman of the FDIC during the 1980s, and that economic crisis to date, and that banking crisis to date, was far more serious, far more serious than anything we're dealing with today. Um, it's very important to understand that, that this is, this is not the worst thing that's happened to us since the Great Depression. I think 73, 74 was almost as bad. I know I don't look that old, but I actually was in banking in 73, 74. <laughs> and I ran the FDIC during the, during the crisis of the 80s. Uh, the the, the uh, other thing we, we hear frequently uh, said in, in, uh, by the media and in government officials is that greed caused this crisis. And I read something, an article the other day that really struck me. It said that blaming this crisis, this financial crisis on greed, is akin to blaming an airplane crash on gravity. <laughs> greed is a force of nature. It's what makes our economic model work. We need greedy people to go out and try to earn a living and make more money. And the government's job is to keep the system from crashing. To keep, to keep ch greed in check, just as the FAA or whoever the folks are who regulate airlines uh, try to keep them in check so that we don't have airline crashes. Uh, 
because if they if they don't maintain the planes right, they will they will fall to the ground. Gravity tells us that, and greed tells us if we don't have proper regulation in place and supervision in place, greed will bring the system down. We know that. That's not a new lesson. The 1980s, we had very high inflation in the late 19 in the late 1970s. Paul Volcker was named chairman of the Fed in 1979 and immediately set out to kill inflation. And he did. He did a very effective job and he raised the prime rate to 21.5%. Now for any bankers in the crowd or, or borrowers, if you've borrowed money at 6% and or loaned it at 6% and the prevailing interest rate goes up to 21.5%, how many borrowers are going to be able to repay the loan at that rate? Very few. So we had a very, very difficult, challenging economic environment in which borrowers were going broke left and right. And inside the financial system, thrift, thrift institutions, the SNLs and the savings banks were simply not viable under those conditions. They, they couldn't afford to pay what it took because they were filled up with long-term assets, long-term mortgages at fixed rates and government bonds. If we had, if we had had the accounting system back then that we have today, if we had been required to mark those mortgages to market as we are doing today because they have a security wrapped around them, the SNLs would have been insolvent to the tune of $100 billion and the savings bank the same. So we, had, we would have had $200 billion of insolvencies back there at a time when the FDIC fund was $11 billion and the FSLIC fund, which insured the SNLs, was $5 billion. Obviously, we needed to find a way out of that problem that cost less than $100 billion. We did, and the FDIC got out of the savings bank problem for a net loss of $1.8 billion. Faced with a $100 billion insolvency, we found a way to manage our way out of that problem at a cost of $1.8 billion. That we can't do today. With mark-to-market -to -market accounting, we're destroying hundreds of billions of dollars of capital in our financial system needlessly because markets aren't functioning. At the same time we had this thrift crisis going on, we had a depression in agriculture, a literal depression in agriculture, which sent hundreds of farm banks down. We had, um, we had a collapse in the energy sector, which affected the, the, the southwest, the west, the southeast, the energy, energy producing states. And we had our money center banks all loaded up with third world debt. And that was trading at about 10 cents on the dollar or cents on the dollar, I'll well put it that way. If we'd had to mark all of those institutions to market, every one of our money center banks would have been insolvent. In fact, we had a contingency plan in place to nationalize them if we had to. We would only do it if the countries not only defaulted but renounced their debts and then we would have had no choice. We would have had to do something about our money center banks. But as long as those countries didn't default, and, and didn't renounce their debts, we were content to ride this thing out and see how it worked. Good thing we did, because we, we, we didn't have to fail all the firms that we, had, that, that we otherwise would have had to have failed. Altogether, oh, but then I forgot, we had a real, rolling real estate recession. Started in the southwest, went to the west, went to the southeast, went to the northeast, and then the mid-Atlantic mid states. Wiping out institutions, a lot of large institutions. Continental Illinois, the seventh largest bank, failed in 1984. I handled that one. Uh, of uh, Major regional banks failed. Nine out of the ten largest Texas banks failed. Altogether, we had 3,000 bank and thrift failures. Now, i got to tell you, folks, uh, that was a much more serious banking crisis than we're dealing with today, where we've had, what, 30 failures so far this year? We still had 1,500 problem, ba problem banks at the end of 91 after 3,000 banks and thrift had already failed. And today we have 200 and some on the problem bank list. I'm not saying things can't get worse. I'm not saying things won't get worse. I don't know. But I'm telling you they aren't as bad today as they were back, th as they were back then. Nor is the economy. We had a, an unemployment rate of 11%. We had a severe two-year recession. It was a very harsh time. People forget it, but it was a very tough time. Tougher than we have today so far in the economy. Could get worse today, but I hope not. Um, I, I, I ask myself all the time, well, how, do, how did we get through that with relative ease? A lot of long hours. How do we get through that period with relative ease compared to today? And I think it's because we, we learned the, the wrong lessons back then. We said, hey, we need more faith 
and we need we need more we need more faith in mathematical models and more faith in the marketplace to deal with all these problems in the system. We can't give regulators judgment, uh, let them use judgment. We're going to have to do something that, 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 really mean, that really will ensure that we can't go through another crisis because the mathematical models will force people. The Basel II capital standards, Basel I, I've been opposed to them. The FDIC has been opposed to them since they came out fought them strenuously and I have I have lots of congressional testimony saying there will come a time these are highly pro cyclical there will come a time when we're going to regret we put Basel capital models in place mathematical models don't work they look backward and then they project forward if you look backward in 2005 what's the model telling you it's an easy business 10 years of prosperity it's an easy business you don't have losses you don't need capital that's what the models tell you when you're doing them in 2005. When you're doing them today, what are they telling you? That you, you don't have near enough capital. You can't have enough capital. And so what we're doing is we're, we're fueling the boom by letting banks reduce their capital in good times, and then we're keeping them, uh, we're, 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 we're burdening them with having to increase their capital in, in bad times, which means we can't get out of the cycle. Mark to market accounting. We had mark to market accounting in the 1930s. And in 1938, President Roosevelt called together the Secretary of the Treasury and the bank regulators and he said, what is it? Eight years of depression, we can't get out of it, banks won't lend, how do we change it? And the answer they came up with, get rid of mark-to-market -market accounting on bank investment portfolios. And that's what they did. FASB and the SEC got the, the bright idea in the, in the early 1990s that we wouldn't have had an SNL crisis if, we, uh, crisis if we'd had mark-to-market -market accounting, so we should put it back in place. And Alan Greenspan, the chairman of the Fed, Bill Taylor, the chairman of the FDIC, and Nick Brady, the secretary of the Treasury, all wrote letters and saying, don't do it. You'll regret it if you do. I wrote articles about it saying, don't do it. Long-term lending institutions have to take intermediation risk, and if you do this, you are going to cripple the financial system, particularly in difficult times. Nick Brady was prescient in his 1992 letter, May, uh, March 24, 1992. He said, if you do this, you're going to introduce a new element of severe volatility in bank earnings and bank capital, and you're going to create major credit crunches. Exactly what has happened today, Nick Brady said would happen if they adopted that thing. Uh, so those are mistakes that we have made. and. Uh, and, and, and it, I can go on. It, we, have, we have FDIC insurance premiums that banks don't pay in good times, but they do in bad times. They have special assessments in bad times. Just absolutely backward. Um, the SEC took an enforcement action against SunTrust banks in 1999, telling them they could not create reserves in, in these good times because they couldn't justify them. They were just managing earnings. So they put a, a dampening effect on the ability of banks to create loan loss reserves at a time when they can afford them. And now we're, 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 we're pressing on the banks to create more and more and more reserves. And we're continuing to make mistakes. These stress tests, why they announced publicly that we're going to have stress tests, I don't know. We've had tr stress tests on major banks for, for decades. It's a part of the risk management program of every large bank to run stress tests. Why did we have to announce and focus all of this attention on stress tests? And now we're saying to the banks, if you flunk the stress test under severe conditions, nobody apparently flunks it today, but if, if you don't have enough capital in a worst case scenario, we're going to make you raise it right now. Now, do we want banks to lend or do we want them to raise capital? I thought we've been telling them for the last year, lend money. You can't have both. You've got to take your choice. Either they're going to lend right now or they're going to raise capital right now. They can't do both. And the way they're going to, if you, put, if you impose that burden on them, the way they're going to meet the capital standards is they're going to shrink their balance sheets so they come into compliance. Or we're going to put more taxpayer money in or whatever. We still haven't forced FASB to turn around mark-to-market -market accounting after destroying several hundred billion dollars of capital. Why don't, we, why don't we take on FASB? Why don't we force them to change it? And if they won't, and if the SEC won't supervise them, we, let's change the, the way we, we promulgate accounting rules. And there's a bill pending in Congress to do that, and I fully support it. It says that accounting standards and the FASB are going to be overseen by the Fed, the FDIC, the SEC, the PCAOB, and somebody else. 
that we're going to have we're going to have the financial no, treasury we're going to have the financial institution regulators all across the board involved in the setting of accounting policy because accounting policy is simply too important for accountants to set it it has way too many systemic effects and we need some input from people who have knowledge of and responsibility for maintaining stability in our financial system. Um, I, I, have you done your thing yet? Oh, am I, I'm still on time. Oh, wait. She said, when I go like this, you're done. <laughs> <laughs> I was ignoring you. <laughs> well, let, me, let, me, let me wrap up by saying I also think we have created, we have, we have uh, two quick points. We've, we've done a lot of things that are highly destabilizing in handling the crisis. In WAMU, we wiped out $20 billion worth of bondholders, and we wiped out an investor group that put $7 billion in that institution months before it failed. You don't do that in a crisis. You just don't do that. We let laymen fail. You don't do that in a crisis. You find a way for it not to fail. You don't, you don't let Fannie and Freddie go down and wipe out the preferred shareholders who are investors from out, throughout the world in our financial system including a lot of our domestic banks are holding that preferred stock and having to take the hits. You don't do those things in troubled times. I don't care what your philosophy is, you don't have a philosophy when you're in a crisis. You do whatever you need to do to maintain stability. We didn't do it. And, and, and we made matters worse, much worse than they needed to be. <clears throat> the final point I'd make <clears throat> is on this idea of a, what is it, a systemic risk regulator. I think I, I like the idea. Um, I don't know who I would make the systemic risk regulator because I don't, I don't see any regulator that got it right. Uh, I see regulators, as you can tell from my talk, who did a lot of things that don't make sense, that, 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 were, that were, were not promoting stability in the system. Um, the be but I do think we need to f focus on stability uh, in, uh, on systemic risk and, and trying to maintain stability. The best I can come up with is we get the people who are responsible for it, the SEC, the Treasury, the Fed, the FDIC, and the controller of the currency, whomever you want to put, and we, 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 we formalize them into a, a, a market stability board. We require them to meet monthly. We give them a staff. Uh, we allow them to work through the system and they can go to the OCC or the FDIC and say do this and do this and and we really try to identify on a regular basis what the, what the stability risks are and to come up with programs and recommendations for how we, we, we get some of that risk out of the system. Uh, but I don't trust any single agency to do that job. I think the FDIC, and I, I'm not saying it because of my former agency, I really, really am not because that's not the way I operate. Uh, I, I think the FDIC probably called it best. It was opposed to Basel II. It was opposed to mark-to-market -market accounting. It, 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 it really, I think it got it right but more than most of the agencies, but I wouldn't even trust my, my own agency to be the systemic risk regulator. I think we need a, 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 group of, a group of people, we need all the wisdom in the room we can get, and we need to put them to work on the problem. Thank you very much, I got to sign. <laughs> <laughs>Thank you, Bill. That was a fascinating uh, historical perspective on some of the problems that we have today. And clearly, you're someone who's been through it. I, I just wondered how you managed not to get gray hair in the midst of all that. So. <laughs> uh, <laughs> I wasn't asking but, you to tell but any I do secrets. I have an eight year old and a six year old at home, which helps. <laughs> Very good. Um, we, we, you might have noticed that we were missing a speaker here on the panel, and uh, he'll be joining us very shortly, but I think we'll give him a chance to just uh, draw breath and, and move to Devin Sharma, uh, president of Standard & Poor's, the credit rating agency, and much more than that, but that's how most of us know Standard & Poor's. Um, Mr. Sharma's been with uh, McGraw-Hill Companies for a number of years, uh, and before that was on the consulting side with Booz Allen and Hamilton. So, welcome. And you Thank you, to Dr. Julius. <clears throat> this morning, uh, there was a number of comments made and highlights uh, about the complexity of the global markets, the interdependence of the global markets, and the calls for uh, continued stability for the global markets, but at the same time allowing for innovation. And in all of that, uh, there were a number of calls for a new financial architecture that sm supports a smooth functioning of these capital markets because we know the benefits 
and of a well-functioning market and the costs of a non-well-functioning market. So we at Standard & Poor's naturally have spent a great deal of time reflecting on the current situation and the disappointment with the ratings on structured finance securities. And we have naturally made a number of significant changes to restore confidence in the ratings process and the credit markets. As part of this process of self-reflection, we have spoken with hundreds of users of ratings. These users tend to fall into one of three groups, investor, issuer, or counterparty. It's important to note, especially when maintaining independence and objectivity, that at any given moment, the same institution can be in all three categories, depending on what role the firm plays in the capital markets. Those conversations have informed our thinking about the future and role of regulation. The feedback has been remarkably consistent. Investors strongly believe that any regulatory changes must be built on a set of common global standards that provide a framework to encompass from end to end all activities in the capital markets. There is general agreement that regulation should focus on the safety and soundness of financial markets and be based on transparency and fair dealings. This requires that regulation should focus on the actual activities of a firm rather than its stated business. So for example, all firms originating mortgages should be subject to the same guidelines and regulations as the issuer in ensuring the accuracy and reliability of the data underlying the structured security. The same principle of common regulatory standards should hold true for other market participants, such as lenders, professional investors, and us rating firms. Regulation should also provide for consistent and coordinated enforcement while maintaining the adaptability and flexibility to accommodate future growth and ev evolution. Finally, regulation should not create any barriers to entry. Instead, it should help foster competition from new entrants. In addition, in terms of specific recommendation for credit rating firms, regulation should consider promotion of credit ratings that are analytically sound, independent, and unbiased. The use of ratings in regulation should also be examined carefully as there may have been an over-reliance on credit ratings by many investors. Regulation should promote also competition among rating firms to foster differing perspectives on creditworthiness. Any new regulation should also consider the barriers it creates, and this particularly applies to any effort to create unique levels of liability, which would make it more difficult for newer participants to compete. However, regulation should be applied in uniformly across all types of rating firms. Different firms have different business models, and there is growing consensus that regulation promoting greater transparency and robust disclosure would help prevent potential conflict of interest or manipulation by powerful interests on both the issuer and investor side of any transaction. As many of you know, there is a potential model for an international regulatory approach in the IOSCO Code of Conduct which was updated last May and endorsed by the G20 as a way to regulate rating firms on a global basis. In addition to developing a regulatory structure modeled off the IOSCO code, we think any potential regulation of ratings should take a holistic view of ratings and examine the role of ratings in the capital markets. In other words, regulation should cover all participants in the capital markets who both contribute to the ratings process as well as use the ratings. From the origination of the collateral and the information used in the ratings process to the sales and marketing of securities of issuance, regulators should examine what standards exist and how any erosion in those standards could impact the holder of security. Many people have expressed numerous ideas on how best to achieve these goals, but the overriding principle for us should be transparency. Transparency, of course, means information, processes, and methodologies, as well as how the business operates free from conflicts. That is crucial to promoting accountability and restoring trust in, on which the markets depend. But what is transparency? And I think this is a topic that was covered by <coughs> Scott and others. Is it simply access to as much information as possible? 
or is it access to all the information that can help the recipient? In today's extraordinarily complex and volatile global markets, what exactly should transparency mean with regard to credit ratings? Just as markets depend on confidence and trust, confidence and trust depend on fair and equal access to information. But there is a need to balance comprehensiveness with clarity. What investors need is relevant transparency. They need regulations and practices that help them get relevant information in a form they can organize, digest, and use. We also need to recognize that not all investors are created equal, and we need to consider both the large institutional investors as well as the small investors with limited resources and time whose confidence in the free market system is just as crucial to its survival and recovery. Investors clearly have an absolute right to expect from rating agencies high levels of transparency about ratings as well as information to help form their own view of the soundness of ratings analysis. That includes rating methodologies, models, and performance. For us at Standard & Poor's, transparency has become one of the core principles of our business. We believe increasing transparency in how we operate and the assumptions and conclusions of our analysis are key to restoring confidence in the ratings process. Let me take a few moments and spell out what transparency means to us and, and when you think about the rating firms. First, we believe transparency must enable comparability. <clears throat> Investors should be able to compare ratings and form their own view of the soundness of the ratings analysis. For some time, we at Standard Poor's have made our criteria available on our website so that all market participants have the opportunity to review and understand the framework of our analysis. Rating firms also should publicly disclose the ratings performance statistics to help investors assess rating quality as we now do. That should permit comparisons of ratings across asset classes and geographic locations. In fact, in response to the severe deterioration in the credit quality of the structured securities rated between 2000 and 2007, we have begun to issue monthly performance rep reports on US RMBS and CDOs of ABS. Second, transparency also must foster clarity and consistency, which means the use of ratings should be clear. Thus, that must include their limitations and the level of risk inherent in the rating. Assumptions that are key to the rating process should also be made clear. S&P has taken the step of publishing scenario analyses that outline our thinking on a range of stress tests for a given asset class or a type of security. Regulation, we also believe, should promote clear and consistent application of rating policies to minimize surprises when and if ratings are changed. In a globalized economy, the ratings process must be transparent across geographic jurisdictions, industry sectors, and asset classes. For example, at S&P, we utilize a global rating scale that serves as a common language across all major sectors of the economy and regions of the world. Let me also turn to how transparency can serve to protect investors and increase the user engagement and scrutiny. Clear understanding of ratings rationales makes it easier for users of ratings to compare their own analysis to that of a rating firm. The more the participants understand the rating process, the more they can decide which firm's research <coughs> is worth incorporating into their investment decision-making decision process. That comparison is key to sustaining quality standards. Investor choice is the ultimate <coughs> accountability for rating firms. Let me close by talking about transparency and how it can facilitate the application of regulations. Let me pick up a very key topic. Ratings has served an important role as a benchmark in the investment decision-making process. However, in many jurisdictions, credit ratings were the only benchmarks in regulation, which may have led to over-reliance on them. The role of credit ratings in regulation should be re-examined or alternately other benchmarks critical to the investment decision should be considered in the regulation. The practice of use of ratings as triggers by many companies should also be examined 
and be made transparent. While an effective regime should include oversight of rating policies and standards for managing potential conflicts of interest, the firm's rating opinions and methodologies should be free from regulatory interference. Regulators shouldn't be put in the position of second-guessing rating opinions, nor should they interfere in any rating firm's ability to foster innovation or respond to innovation in the capital markets. These principles spell out what I mean by relevant transparency. I believe all market participants across the whole of the capital market should embrace relevant transparency. Embracing this notion will protect investors, provide clarity around business practices, allow for greater accountability of performance, and improve regulators and legislators' understanding of the roles of the market participants. Given where we are today, I think we can agree that increased and more relevant transparency is something we can all support. Thank you. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. Uh, we have a, a final speaker uh, just in time has, has arrived, uh, Eric Donalo, the superintendent of the New York State Insurance Department, uh, someone who's been closely involved with the AIG rescue, I understand, as well as uh, many other exciting episodes, I'm sure, uh, with considerable private sector experience as well as, as public sector. So thank you very much. You. Um, I think that it's more like 1907 because it's, it's a true credit crisis. It's a crisis of confidence about uh, the counterparty. And I think if you study that time, you'll see that the people then, after 1907, understood some basic truths around the need for capitalization of what I would call four basic buckets of how we hand our money over to a counterparty. So the first bucket is banking. And we hand our money over in a banking transaction, FDIC insured, on sort of a binary relationship and it's guaranteed. So it's a guaranteed outcome, essentially. Our whole country is guaranteed around this or structure that you will show up and you will get your money plus some modest interest. And it's capitalized that way. And the set-asides, what uh, Wall Street commonly calls haircuts and we often call reserves, are set around that need. The second is insurance, which actually is very important here, and is similarly uh, a guaranteed outcome, meaning you pay your premiums if your house falls down, our whole state regulatory system and the reserves we set are around the concept that all state will pay you on that event. And there have been there have been insurance failures, not unlike banking failures, but they've been modest and generally those events are paid off at a very, very high um, guaranteed rate. Again, a binary outcome. Uh, the third, which is important and um, a little less controversial than it'll sound, is gambling. Regulated gambling actually is an important part of this and casinos and the racetracks have very strict capital set-asides for the activity. Again, if the third race, if your horse hits at Belmont, you will be paid. If actually, it's a rumor, but I have it confirmed by calling my friends in Nevada, that if you know every roulette table goes 36 red at the same time, there is a tremendous amount of capital required to be set aside by casinos to make good on those guarantee. Again, a guaranteed set aside, guaranteed event and we capitalize it accordingly. The fourth is what we'll just call investments, mere aspirational undertakings. Securities, bonds, et cetera, arguably the derivatives of those. That's, you know, your IBM stock today is worth, I don't know, 80 or $90, could be worth zero. See Lehman Brothers. There's no guarantee. We have transparency. We have market oversight. We have exchanges. There is set aside, of course, but it's nothing like as if we are guaranteeing a certain outcome. And we, um, in the year 2000, did this wonderful thing called the Commodities Futures Modernization Act, um, where we decided that whole categories of derivatives were going to be put, I'm going to say, in some magical fifth bucket that we'll call alchemy for the purposes of this discussion. Um, because we thought we had discovered a way of essentially 
guaranteeing certain obligations, but with nothing of the regulatory capital set aside that we have appropriately required for 100 years. So since we have a little time, we'll just focus on the often beat up upon credit default swap. Okay, a credit default swap we're going to put in the fifth bucket. It is either acting as an insurance contract, right? The trader buys it to guarantee the bottom of his or her book versus the CDOs that they hold. Or if you hold Ford bonds, you buy the CDS to cover the possibility that Ford will default and someone else will pick up on those payments. Or it turns out it's gambling in the old fashioned appropriate sense of the word where you essentially have no exposure to Ford or to those CDOs, but you go short essentially with the hope that there'll be a default and you'll make good on that bet. By the way, Wall Street calls it directional bets. I call it gambling and the governor's office gets angry, but that's like a whole nother psychodynamic that I deal with. In 1909, yeah, I got a call. He said the G word again. In 1909, largely in response to the credit crisis and part of the exacerbating cause of the credit crisis were the, quote, bucket shops that were all over New York City and other major cities. These were places where you could speculate on the closing of securities prices and exchanges without actually buying engaging in the transaction on credit sounds a lot like a credit default swap and the trades were bucketed by which they would just take the trades they wouldn't actually do the trades and they just toss them in a bucket that's why it was called a bucket shop and they had a hugely important impact on the credit freeze of 1907 and by 1909 they were prohibited in the major cities to blazing headlines in the New York Times which you can get online and see it it's pretty cool and they'd already been closed down because nobody wanted to face the felonies and why am I telling you this because these really smart people by the way we think we were like so much smarter than people 100 years ago like Marie Curie and Albert Einstein and JP Morgan and Picasso and so we apparently didn't have the self-esteem to realize that we had it right for 100 years. And in the CFMA, we decided that these huge areas of derivatives were not going to be called securities, right? Because they were going to be unregulated and not subject to the SEC. They were not going to be futures for the CFTC purposes. And they were not going to be subject to the bucket shop laws because guess what? They would have been and... Congress specifically preempted them from regulation by these bucket shop laws. So what happens? Wall Street, ingeniously and appropriately, as we were saying before, because greed is, um, well, I won't say it's good because I could get quoted, but greed is an important part of our capitalist system. And when Wall Street has an opportunity, what they'll do, this is what, this is what regulation is really about, is setting the proper capital requirements. So they will, as, as quickly as possible, as they should legally, find a way to replicate the same activity they can do in the, in the regulated area, but with stricter, higher capital requirements, they will do in the unregulated area to much lower, if even non-existent, capital requirements. So as you know, CDS is, if you had a double or triple A requirement, I mean, uh, rating, there was absolutely no capital required as between the counterparties, because we told the world that these were all going to be private contracts subject to, um, to private uh, negotiation and therefore no required capital set aside. I think that that's how the market became $63 trillion for credit default swaps, probably about 80% of them being the naked variety, the one where you don't actually hold the bonds or have any true exposure to the underlying credit event. And I think by by, by basically disregarding these buckets, which had functioned fairly well for 100 years, we permitted this extreme explosion in this kind of alchemical area that, that regulators can't really chase down because we were told by Congress it was going to be unregulated. And... Um, Compliance officers, et cetera, can't really um, make any argument about it because, again, there was no requirement for capital 
set aside. We then did something else which synergistically blew us up to some extent. We, the year later, or the year before, I, I get my years off, I'm getting, see I have the gray hair, he doesn't. Um, we uh, did the, we abrogated Glass-Steagall. Now, I'm not an old fashioned guy, but again, these guys and gals 100 years ago, 1933 I think or so, they understood that these buckets maybe needed to be kept separate, that the leveraged activities of the investment side could do serious damage to these sort of sacred depository institutions of banking and insurance. And that the activities would potentially vaporize all of those deposits. So they stodgedly separated those activities. That's what Glass-Steagall does. And with Graham Leach Bliley, we permitted the creation of financial supermarkets. And again, we all applauded because the French were going to be better than us and everyone was going to rush off to London. I wish so much, I wish all this business had rushed off to London. That would have been a good thing, <laughs> as far as I can tell. Okay. And we created these financial supermarkets. Now, what's cool about these financial supermarkets, when you think about it, an AIG would be Exhibit A. So if you study 1907 and you study AIG, I think you'll sort of know more than enough about what happened, was they created a financial products division, which for the purposes of this discussion, I'll call the bolted-on bucket shop. I, don't, I used to say hedge fund, but the hedge fund industry got really angry and pointed out they would have never run it that poorly, and they're right. And they wrote $2.7 trillion of notional exposure of derivatives and kicks and other, other cliff events, uh, CDSs in particular, against a $100 billion base of capital. That's just lunacy. We would never, ever permit anyone to have that kind of a ratio. And so you have a holding company regulated um, I, by the OTS. You have the bolted on hedge fund here. Sorry, I said it again, bucket shop. Regulated, I guess, derivatively by the OTS. And you have the operating insurance companies with regulatory set aside for the insurance obligations. And AIG had a triple A rating at one point and then a double A. And counterparties dealt with it as if that were the case. And if you think about it, if you ever had removed that hedge fund off here separately, no one would have ever done the kind of derivatives guarantee with them. There was an assumption that they had an access to the whole trillion dollar balance sheet. So one of the really kind of exciting moments of the weekend of AIG was when everyone realized that when I said that we abrogated, we kind of knocked down these walls from Glass-Steagall to Graham Leach Bliley, we fortunately only did it kind of halfway. We permitted the creation of financial supermarkets, but we did keep up largely the regulatory moats around those depository institutions like the insurance operating companies and the commercial bank operating companies. So when everyone came for their uh, 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 tens of billions in capital collateral calls, there was no money there because it wasn't accessible into, from, in, into and from the operating companies. But the world essentially understood that it was able to get at that. That's why they extended them credit. And so my thesis to a large extent is that while I'm not really saying we should completely go back to Glass-Steagall, we have to understand what we're really getting by these too big to fails. I'm not clear that the currently the discussion about we need to regulate, come up with a structure that deals with too big to fail is actually the right question. We have to first ask whether too big to fail from that methodology which is what it creates systemic risk, right? Systemic risk is about the huge extension on credit globally with leverage where you may not actually ultimately have the capital. Government traditionally had been involved in stopping runs on the bank, whether actually a bank or an insurance company. What we've actually done is we've let some institutions create or engage in systemic risk and have this knock-on effect on these depository institutions. Any single big bank or insurance company, I would submit, 
d alone, even very large, does not create systemic risk. It has a run on the bank issue that regulators have to deal with and rush in and prevent, but it is not causing systemic risk. We've permitted institutions to cause extensive systemic risk that they would never otherwise be able to achieve if they didn't apparently have these huge balance sheets behind them that aren't actually available because otherwise they would have just been a standalone hedge fund here i mean it politely that would have adjudicated and others would have adjudicated their counterparty risk for them but not with some assumption that um we had this tremendous balance sheet behind them that gave them the both the rating and the statute uh, the capital oomph that really wasn't there and i think that if i were to sort of recommend what would be job one of this systemic risk regulator? I would say two things, that he or she should go through all of our financial products, the companies and our regulations, and see if like capital activities in those four buckets, because I still can't think of a fifth, where we actually turn over, well, maybe a gunpoint felony, that would be a fifth, I guess, <laughs> that the capital requirements are set properly and then look and sit on top of one of these companies like AIG and others, there are others obviously, and look down and say over here you have binary guarantees on say life insurance and property and there's certain reserves and capital set asides against those and the proper amounts, and over here in this leveraged activity, you have are making, because of the fusing of the four buckets, very similar, if not identical, guarantees and set-asides, whether it's gambling or insurance or potentially banking products, although I think we get that one right, and you have nothing close to the proper capital if your commitments should go against you and sort of say, um, what's up? basically. And that to me, although really boring and kind of blocking and tackling and stogy, is exactly what I would recommend would be a first order undertaking. And that involves a revisitation of Glass-Steagall and a revisitation of the Commodities Futures Modernization Act. But I do believe that there is kind of a Euclidean truth about this that we disregarded to our great, great detriment as a society. Thank you very much. Well, thank you very much, Mr. Donello. That was uh, uh, an, an a gripping uh, insight into just uh, what went wrong and to some extent why things went wrong uh, in, in the whole AIG disaster. Uh, I'm afraid we're, we're going to have to forego our Q&A today um, because it's necessary that we uh, get ourselves across the road. We'll be getting some instructions in a second about how to do that. Uh, I guess I would just say uh, I think what we've heard from a number of our panel members, and we almost have a criminal lineup here of bankers, uh, credit rating agencies, these regulators. I mean, it's a good thing this is not a congressional hearing, or it could have been a, a, a very difficult one for, for me to chair. Uh, but I think what we've heard from them is that, to some extent, we have to go back to economic history uh, and learn some of the lessons of the past, make sure we learn the right lessons from this one, so that uh, at least future crises won't be quite as bad as some of the ones that we've faced. And perhaps you can join me in thanking our panel for a really fascinating discussion. <laughs>